Hi guys, in today's video, we are going to discuss about fibrous dysplasia. So, fibrous dysplasia from its name, we know that there is a fibrous component that is present. So, what happens is that your normal bone is replaced by fibrous connective tissue. So, there is basically a lot of proliferation of fibrous tissue and then there is secondary metaplastic changes that takes place which leads to bone formation. So, there is secondary metaplastic bone formation and there is fibrous tissue in place of your normal bone in this condition. So, basically it is a skeletal developmental anomaly which is non-hereditary and there is a defect in osteoblastic differentiation and maturation which leads to the replacement of normal bone by an excessive proliferation of cellular connective tissue which is intermixed with irregular bony trabeculae. So, if I was to show you, this is how it looks. So, these are the irregular bony trabeculae and th this is your fibrous connective tissue. Okay? So, now coming to the etiology. So, what happens is there is a mutation of GNAS1 gene which leads to the activation of G protein. Now, because of the activation of G protein, there is an overproduction of cyclic AMP and this overproduced cyclic AMP results in the hyperfunction of the endocrine system and the increased proliferation of melanocytes. So, now that there is hyperfunction of the endocrine system, what you would observe is precocious puberty. Apart from that, because of the hyperfunction of the endocrine system, you would see overproduction of growth hormone, cortisol and hyperthyroidism, which will lead to its own manifestations. Apart from that, because there is increased proliferation of melanocytes, you would see large cafe olet spots. Now, cafe olet is basically your um, coffee which is mixed with milk. So, that is the color of these spots. And if you recall, these spots are also seen in neurofibromatosis. So, your clinical manifestations are basically apparent at 5 to 15 years of age. But this mutation begins in the embryo stage, right? So, um, your manifestation will depend on when this mutation happens. So, for example, if the mutation took place when the cells were undifferentiated, they were basically undifferentiated stem cells during early embryogenesis, your mutation would affect all these three cells. So, it would affect the osteoblasts, it would affect the melanocytes and it would affect the endocrine cells. So, if it is affecting the osteoblasts, you will see multiple bone lesions. If because it was affecting the melanocytes, you will see cutaneous pigmentation, that is cafe or lid spot. And because there was endocrine hyperfunction, you would see endocrine disturbance. But if it took place at a later stage of embryogenesis, your manifestation would be mainly restricted to osteoblasts. And if it took place in the postnatal life, uh, you would see that this progeny of mutated cells is just confined to one site. So, depending on the bones that are affected or on the number of bones that are affected, we classify fibrous dysplasia as monostotic fibrous dysplasia when one bone is affected and polystotic fibrous dysplasia when more than one bone is affected. So, let's talk about monostotic fibrous dysplasia first. So, it's more common and luckily less severe. It's seen in 70 to 80 percent of the cases. Uh, it's more common in children and young adults and the common sites are rib, femur, tibia, craniofacial bones and humerus. This is in the decreasing order. So, it's more commonly seen in the rib followed by femur, followed by tibia, followed by craniofacial bones and humerus. I'm not saying that it's all these bones are affected, single bone is affected. So, it's either the rib or the femur or the tibia or the craniofacial bone or the humerus. Alright. Now, if it happens in the craniofacial bones, uh, that is the jaw bones, it's commonly seen in the maxilla and the associated bones and this would result in the leonine appearance of the face. This is called as leonchiasis osia. So, because your maxilla is the one that is affected so there is a lot of proliferation in the maxilla and that's the reason your maxilla is going to grow outwards and this typical appearance is exactly what we see in a lion. So as you can see here the maxilla of this patient has enlarged while the mandible is not affected 
and that's the reason we compare it to the face of a lion now another form is craniofacial fibrous dysplasia it's actually classified as a form of monostotic fibrous dysplasia even though it is involving more than one bone it's basically involving it's it's basically involving craniofacial bones right so it's involving more than one bone but still we classify it as monostotic fibrous dysplasia in these patients you would see that there is painless enlargement of craniofacial bones which results in disfigurement of the face the patient might also complain of a headache or bital pain and in advanced cases it might lead to blindness because of the compression of optic nerve in the optic canal apart from that there could also be hearing loss and vestibular dysfunction when the sphenoid and the temporal bones are involved so this is what we spoke about monostotic fibrous dysplasia there's not a lot to remember basically it's just that it's more common less severe you need to remember the bones that are most commonly affected and we specifically spoke a little about the maxilla and then we spoke about its variant which is craniofacial fibrous dysplasia which is also a type or it is considered as a monostotic form of fibrous dysplasia next we have the polyostotic fibrous dysplasia so obviously there is involvement of more than one bone in this case it's less common and more severe um you see it before 10 years of age and the common bones that are involved again in the decreasing order of frequency is femur which is this bone tibia which is this bone pelvis ribs skull and facial bones upper extremities lumbar spine and cervical spine so femur and tibia are like the most commonly involved bones right so yeah that's about the bones that are involved that's the site now coming to the clinical presentation now because this is polyostotic fibrous dysplasia you will see that this is basically happening when your uh, embryo is in the early stage of embryogenesis it's in the undifferentiated stem cells so it's going to affect more than just your osteoblasts right it's going to affect your melanocytes it's going also going to affect your endocrine cells so your clinical presentation is also going to be like this so a patient with fibrous dysplasia in polyostotic fibrous dysplasia would complain of bone pain spontaneous fractures with bowing of long bones so bowing of long bones basically means that uh, your it's basically a condition in which the knees will stay apart even when standing with feet and ankles together so as you can see in this diagram your feet and ankles are together so usually when you do that your knees will come together but in such patients the knees are going to stay apart you will also see leg length discrepancies and shepherd hook deformity which is uh, your femoral neck and the proximal shaft is more curved so it gives you this shepherd hook deformity that you see so this is about fibrous dysplasia now apart from that because your melanocytes are affected you will see cafe au lait spots and you will see it at the same site of the bone lesions they are usually present in the midline of the body that is your lower back shoulder and neck these are the common sites your endocrine cells can also be affected which as we already discussed would present as early breast development early pubic hair development hyperthyroidism adrenal disorders diabetes hyperpituitarism and hypercalcemia so these could also be present now there are some syndromes which you can remember so if all these three are present if there is fibrous dysplasia there is cutaneous pigmentation and there is endocrine uh, dysfunction this triad is basically known as macune albright syndrome this triad of fibrous dysplasia with cutaneous pigmentation and endocrine dysfunction is macune albright syndrome but if your endocrine dysfunction is not present so that means you have fibrous dysplasia with cutaneous pigmentation this is known as jaffe's type okay so you have cutaneous pigmentation and fibrous dysplasia you minus endocrine system from macune albright syndrome which is a triad 
So two things are affected that is your osteoblasts are affected and your melanocytes are affected. Now if you see fibrous dysplasia with multiple intramuscular myxomas this is known as Mazabrat's syndrome. So these three are from an MCQ point of view. So the first is McCune Albright syndrome where you see all three. Then there is Jaffe's type when you minus endocrine and there is now you in the third one you also minus cutaneous pigmentation but you add intramuscular myxomas that is Mazabrot syndrome. Okay. So this is uh, clinical features where we spoke about monostotic and polystotic fibrous dysplasia. A little about the oral manifestations. So the patient will complain about pain. He will also have a swelling as you can see. So in this case, as you can see, the buccal plate has swollen. There will be a deformity. Your teeth might be malaligned, tip, displaced, etc. Your eruption, the teeth eruption, it, it could be delayed or there could also be an altered eruption sequence. Why is that? It's because due to loss of bone support and endocrine disturbance. So since there is no bone and you know endocrinal disturbances, it's going to lead in an altered eruption sequence. Now, if it affects the maxilla, it's going to be a very serious disease. Mainly because this lesion is not very well circumscribed and it might extend to involve the maxillary sinus, zygomatic process and the base of the skull. Apart from that, it is impossible to eradicate all of this without radical mutilating surgery. That's why when it happens in the maxilla, it's a very serious disease. Okay. Coming to the radiographic features, in the early stage what you would see is a radiolucent lesion. In the mature lesion you would see a ground glass appearance and an orange peel appearance. This is something that you must remember. So basically what you are seeing is a radio opaque spicule in radiolucency. So that is a mixed radio opaque radiolucent lesion which is described as the ground glass and orange peel appearance. If it involves the mandible you would see the expansion of buccal and lingual cortical plates. So, as you can see in this diagram, your buccal and lingual cortical plates have expanded. Right? If, if there is involvement of the maxilla, as we already saw, there could be a lot of things. There could be displacement of the sinus floor and obliteration of the maxillary sinus. So, this is what you would see under the radiograph. Important to note is ground glass and orange peel appear. Coming to the histopathology. Under the microscope, you would see C-shaped trabeculae of woven bone which are not connected to each other and osteoblastic rimming is absent. So if you can see in this diagram, there is osteoblastic rimming which is present around the woven bone. Can you see it here? See all this is osteoblastic rimming. But this is absent in the case of fibrous dysplasia. So this is something very important to note. In normal bone, you would see osteoblasts around this woven bone. But in the case of fibrous dysplasia, you do not see it. You will also see cellular fibrous connective tissue. In the early lesion, you would see more fibrous tissue. While in the advanced lesion, you would see more bony trabeculae. This is clearly because your bone is formed because of secondary metaplastic changes. So, in the advanced stages, you would see more bony trabeculae and these bony trabeculae are arranged in Chinese letter pattern. So, as you can see in this diagram, these are your Chinese letter pattern or C-shaped bony trabeculae. And this is your fibrous connective tissue. Similarly, you can observe your bony trabeculae in this diagram also and as you can see they are not connected to each other and there is no osteoblastic rimming that is present around the woven bone. Coming to the treatment, fibrous dysplasia is self-limiting and it ceases to grow once the patient reaches puberty. Radiotherapy is never the choice of treatment because it increases the chance of malignant transformation. It might lead to osteosarcoma or a fibrosarcoma or a chondrosarcoma. So you never advise radiotherapy to such a patient. If it is a monoostotic fibrous dysplasia, you would advise cosmetic surgery and vitamin D and bisphosphonates can be given to relieve bone pain and reduce osteoclastic activity. But if it is a 
polyostotic fibrous dysplasia you will have to go for a multidisciplinary approach since it affects different cells so this is it about this complex topic about fibrous dysplasia i would really want to give you a very quick recap of whatever we studied so let's begin uh, firstly we studied that it is a defect in the osteoblastic differentiation where your normal bone is replaced by connective tissue which is intermixed with irregular bony trabeculae we studied about the mutation gns1 gene mutation and it leads to overproduction of cyclic amp which leads to hyperfunction of the endocrine system and melanocytes and increased proliferation of melanocytes then we studied that this mutation could happen at three different stages it could happen in the undifferentiated stem cells in the latest course of embryogenesis and in the postnatal life so based on that we discussed about the forms of fibrous dysplasia that is monostotic and polyostotic where in monostotic we studied about the common bones the age and the important um, feature that is the leonine appearance that is seen in the maxilla now we also studied about craniofacial fibrous dysplasia where we said that although it is involving more than one bone it is classified as monostotic fibrous dysplasia we also studied polyostotic fibrous dysplasia where we again studied the common bones and femur and tibia are like the most favorite bones for um this disease and uh, we then studied about the clinical feature where we spoke about features like bone pain spontaneous fractures bowing of long bones and you know shefford hook deformity we also studied about the cafe olet spot and where they are present and um, we also studied about the endocrine dysfunction you must remember these three syndromes for a mcq examination point of view then we studied about the oral manifestations and we studied about the radiographic features where we spoke about the ground glass appearance and the orange peel appearance and more importantly we spoke about how there is expansion of the buccal and lingual plate if there is involvement of the mandible and how there is displacement of the sinus floor and obliteration of the maxillary sinus if there is involvement of the max maxilla then we studied about the histological features about the c shaped bony trabeculae without osteoblastic rimming and they are not connected to each other and how there's a lot of fibrous connective tissue in the treatment you cannot forget about how radiotherapy is never the choice of treatment and monostotic fibrous dysplasia is simply by cosmetic surgery while polyostotic fibrous dysplasia has a multidisciplinary approach so this is it about a very very um long topic i hope by the end of this video you can write a good answer in your examination and i really hope this mind map helped you and and if it did please do um leave a comment for me because it really motivates me to make a lot more of these videos so thank you so much